G'day, and welcome to the channel. You should find this doco quite interesting, and just to add a personal touch, at the end of each bike segment, I'm going to give each bike a thumbs up or a thumbs down, meaning nothing more than would I personally have purchased that particular bike. So let's get into it. When the movie Easy Rider came out in 1969, it increased the popularity of choppers around the whole world. Even though Norton's original 750 Commando was a brilliant motorcycle, Norton needed to boost their sales to compete with the Japanese onslaught at that time, as their future looked very bleak. So, they created this bike, the Norton 750 Commando High Rider. It featured a peanut-sized 9-litre fuel tank, a smaller and probably less than useful headlight, excessively raised ape-hanger style handlebars, and a strange curved banana shaped seat with a sissy bar. I would imagine that that high rear seat hump would have made two up riding just about impossible, but it was all in an effort to create a very cool look. When it was released in 1971, it was described as looking silly or hilarious, but it actually sold reasonably well. The first models were equipped with Norton's cleverly designed, rubber-isolated, air-cooled 745cc parallel twin. Which produced 58 horsepower. Later versions were fitted with the 828cc motor, which developed 60 horsepower. Top speed was 115 miles per hour. A front disc brake replaced the original front drum brake, although it probably wasn't the greatest still. Maybe if the styling was more like this bike, they might have had a real winner on their hands. But the High Rider sold well enough that despite it not being everyone's cup of tea, it stayed in production until 1975. While some may consider it to be the very first factory custom bike, the High Rider was basically a Norton Commando with just a few parts changed. Most people would consider it an ugly duckling, but they do in fact look better in person. Personally, I would describe them as looking ridiculously cool. Original high riders are now very rare, as most owners ended up discarding and replacing most of the chopper parts in favour of more standard parts. In 1973, Triumph unveiled their X75 Hurricane, another bike which was considered a factory custom. Its air-cooled inline three-cylinder 740cc engine produced 58 horsepower. It was pretty much the same engine used in the BSA Rocket 3 and its stablemate the Triumph Trident. The very earliest versions had a four-speed gearbox, but most bikes produced had the more modern five-speed transmission. The front end was higher with longer front forks. It featured a single piece of fiberglass bodywork which flowed seamlessly from the fuel tank down under the seat or side covers right through to the rear grab rail. Three exhaust pipes slanted across the front of the motor and the very distinctive triple stacked and upswept mufflers all exited on the right hand side of the motorcycle spreading out like a fan. All these distinct features combined together made for a very visually striking motorcycle. At first glance, the bike has a semi-rake chopper look about it. It was an eye-catching and radical design, which gave the bike a very distinct style. It had lower gearing than both the Rocket 3 and the Trident, which meant its top speed was down a tad at 115 miles per hour. But the lower gearing combined with its lighter weight meant that its quarter mile times were half a second quicker. at around 13 seconds, which wasn't all that far behind Kawasaki's extremely quick Z1900 of the same era. It was indeed a very fast bike. Conceived and developed in total secrecy, even for management, the bike was funded from BSA Petty Cash and was in fact originally designed to be sold as a BSA. But with BSA's demise and Triumph now under new ownership, the X75 that started life as a BSA 
was instead released as a Triumph X-75 Hurricane. Although sales at the time didn't have a convincing impact, the main reason it led to the bike's sales failure had nothing to do with its looks or its performance. The Hurricane's triple exhausts were very loud. did not meet the new anti-noise restrictions which were introduced in 1973 in its main marketplace, the USA. And this was the reason that led to its sales failure. However, the low sales numbers mean that today the Hurricane is an extremely sought after and collectible motorcycle. Oh, yes. Half a century before these two bikes, a new style of visual design appeared. It was a style that combined functional objects with artistic touches. It influenced the design of buildings, furniture, trains, automobiles, everyday household items, and yes, even motorcycles. It was called Art Deco, and in the United States during the 1930s, a man named Orly Ray Courtney built this. It was a one-off creation built in the Art Deco style. This breathtaking motorcycle was built around a 1930 Henderson 1300cc four-cylinder. The engine in these bikes produced 40 horsepower, and the motors were so flexible that apparently they could accelerate from just 10 miles an hour in top gear, right up to its top speed of over 100 miles per hour. Courtney heavily modified the chassis of the Henderson. The leading link Springer front forks were widened and the rake reduced. The huge handlebars featured an integrated instrument panel with a windscreen. In other words, a fairing. The small diameter 10 inch wheels were fitted with balloon tyres from an aircraft to ensure an ultra smooth ride. The radically designed streamlined body was unlike anything else on two wheels. The panels were hand formed from steel, a stunning execution of skilled metalwork. The result was truly a work of art. The exact colours of the original machine are unknown, but period photos show that it did have a two-tone colour scheme. Courtney had a patent for the complete design. However, none of the mainstream motorcycle manufacturers at the time were interested in adopting his complex and futuristic design, especially at the height of the Great Depression. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a photo that clearly identified Mr Courtney, but judging from the look of that massive sized seat, which was clearly designed for um, a larger framed rider, I think that Mr. Courtney is one of these two men. <laughs> Seriously though, to me the bike looks like it might have been a bit of a handful to ride. But love it or hate it, there is no arguing that it is one of the most stunning examples of Art Deco motorcycle design ever seen. It wasn't Courtney's only design or patent either. He also designed this one, which was called the Enterprise. There were also some other Art Deco styled motorcycles which were designed during the same era. Here are just a few examples. Even one of the most instantly recognisable motorcycles of all time, the Indian Chief, has a touch of Art Deco style about it. In the early 1960s, Ducati decided to build a motorcycle to compete with Harley Davidson for the very lucrative American police motorcycle business. This bike was the 1260cc V4 Apollo. It featured a five speed gearbox an electric starter and a massive 200 watt generator in order to cope with any additional loads imposed by extra police equipment such as sirens, lights and radios. 
It weighed 271 kilos, which was 20 kilos lighter than the Harley-Davidson equivalents at that time. So the initial specs were very impressive. The first prototype's massive V4 engine, which would become Ducati's familiar L configuration, produced 100 horsepower, which was an absolutely huge amount of power in the early 1960s, and 45 more horsepower than the Harley Davidsons of the time. Check this out. Unfortunately, this amount of power was too much for the tyre technology at the time, and the Ducati suffered many rear tyre blowouts at high speeds. When I say high speeds, I'm quite serious. The bike's top speed was over 125 miles per hour. Ducati detuned the engine more than once in an attempt to solve the issue. They eventually ended up with an engine which produced 65 horsepower. While that was still superior to the Harleys, the reduction in power meant that its power to weight ratio was now inferior to its other rivals at the time, both the BMW and the British twins. As a result, Ducati management deemed it too much of a financial risk and the project was abandoned. So effectively, the inability of the tyre companies of the era to come up with a capable tyre to handle such a powerful and heavy motorcycle deprived riders of being able to purchase the very first, what could only be described as, a super sports touring motorcycle. Sorry bro. Would I have bought this Ducati? I doubt it, not with four sets of points to adjust. The Harley Davidson Cafe Racer was a bit foreign to most Harley Davidson riders in 1977. Being so obviously different from any other Harley Davidson, it didn't sell well. It was available in any colour you like, as long as it was black. The XLCR was Harley Davidson's first serious attempt at producing a sports bike. It featured a bikini fairing, a reshaped fuel tank, cast alloy wheels, twin front disc brakes, and a very unique Siamese 2 into 2 exhaust system. The engine was a 1000cc V-twin. Although somewhat unsophisticated, it still produced 68 horsepower. And being lighter and more aerodynamic than most other Harleys, it propelled the bike to a top speed of 115 miles per hour. And with a quarter mile time of 13 seconds, in the late 1970s, it was certainly no slouch. It was like nothing Harley riders had seen before, and sales were somewhat of a disaster. That's not to say it wasn't a great motorcycle, you see, most Harley Davidson riders weren't into cafe races, and only about 3,200 ended up being built between the years 1977 and 1979. They are, in fact, more popular today than they were when they were new, and they are now a somewhat rare and highly sought after motorcycle. I have always loved the XLCR 1000, so would I buy one? In the early 2000s, the Kajiva Extra Raptor 1000 was certainly no ordinary motorcycle. It was designed by the same man that designed the Ducati Monster. It is a machine that combines technical sophistication with outstanding beauty, at least to my eye. 
but the styling is definitely a love it or hate it affair. The radical beak like nose cone arches forward over the front wheel, and the carbon fibre brackets that connect the fairing to the tank look like the devil's horns, giving the bike a very menacing appearance, like it wants to rip your face off or something. A particularly nice touch was the passenger foot peg guards, which look like teeth or claws. There is no denying that it's an extremely aggressive bike, not only in looks but in power delivery. The engine was a modified liquid-cooled 996cc Suzuki V-Twin. It produced 112 horsepower, which was substantially more power than the air-cooled monsters of the same era. The bike had a top speed which approached 150 miles per hour and a quarter mile time of 11 seconds. Give it a handful at any speed and the front wheel lifts with ease. You needed big cojones to ride one fast. And I know this because I had one. Although mine was just the cheaper standard one. My only complaint about the bike was the fueling. The throttle response was ultra sensitive meaning even the slightest movement of the throttle meant constant changes in speed, something that is really annoying, particularly around town. The Kajiva Extra Raptor had a limited production run of 999 motorcycles, so if you have one, hang on to it. Have you ever seen anything like this before? This machine was released by the Turner Manufacturing Company in Great Britain, just after the Second World War. It was designed as a light delivery vehicle. The first prototype pictured here used a two-stroke 126cc Royal Enfield engine. The production bikes featured Turner's own two-stroke, which was 148cc, and later enlarged to 168cc. I couldn't find out exactly how much power these engines produced, but I reckon about 4 or 5 horsepower wouldn't be too far off the mark. You'll notice most of the vehicle's unladen weight is mounted over the front wheel. This was to maximise its carrying capacity in its huge underseat cargo area. The engine, which drove the front wheel by chain, and the fuel tank were both mounted on the handlebars. Starting was done by way of a hand crank starter on the left side of the engine and a lever on the right side operated its two-speed gearbox. After the war, fuel efficiency was a top priority and Turner claimed the bi van could go 90 miles on every gallon of fuel. Top speed was acclaimed 30 miles per hour which sounds absolutely pathetic, I know. But considering the geometry of the bi-van, I would imagine that even travelling at that speed, it was a very nerve-wracking experience. They also made a three-wheeled version called the Tri-Van, and an even rarer version they called the Rixie, which was a rickshaw-type contraption that had seats in the back to carry passengers instead of cargo. It's not clear how many bi-vans, tri-vans or Rixies were produced by Turner, but it must have been only a handful, as they all shared one thing in common, that being they were not successful, and production ceased in the mid-1950s. But would I have purchased a Turner buy van? Quite possibly. I reckon they might have been pretty handy around town. This bike which is an Austrian-made Puk P800, was originally released for civilian and police use in 1936, but it was so good it was quickly drafted into use for the Austrian army. It is an amazing example of pre-war motorcycle manufacturing. At first glance, its 800cc four-cylinder engine looks like a boxer engine, but it isn't. Take a closer look. It's actually an extremely wide-angled V4. Its cylinders were raised 16 degrees from horizontal on each side, 
technically making it a 148 degree V4. However, being almost flat, in reality, it's neither a V4 or a flat 4, so I don't actually know what it is. Apparently, the reason for this very unique design was to give the motorcycle greater ground clearance. It allowed them to raise the bottom edge of the cylinder block by 80 millimeters. The engine produced 20 horsepower and propelled the bike to a top speed of 75 miles per hour. Another unique thing about the P800 was that the clutch assembly was actually inside the rear wheel hub and not between the engine and the gearbox. I'm not quite sure how this actually worked, but it did. With World War II looming and the annexation of Austria into the German Reich, production stopped after only about 550 had been made and many of the bikes were confiscated by the German army and of course later destroyed in the war. There is now only a handful still remaining, approximately 90 left in existence, making it one of the rarest and collectible production motorcycles in the whole world. Cheers, and thanks for watching.